U.S. dollar bills. Emblazoned on each one of them is the motto, in God we trust. But there's nothing biblical that sets the value of the U.S. dollar. U.S. dollars are also known as Federal Reserve notes. That's what it says across the top of them. Uh, the Federal Reserve System was created by Alexander Hamilton, currently starring in a hit musical. <laughs> uh, there are 12 members of the Federal Open Market Committee, the FOMC, and they set the monetary supply in America. And perhaps it would be appropriate to say, in FOMC, we trust. But it doesn't have the same ring to it. Um, we used to tell the passage of time by looking at the movement of the sun and the stars. And now we use atomic clocks. I would like you to ponder with me uh, the future of having an alternative currency that instead of being regulated by 12 men and women or any country or any institution, one regulated by the laws of math, science, and of algorithms. The currency is called Bitcoin, and Bitcoin, all the transactions that are done using it, are recorded in this global, open, distributed database, often called a ledger, known as blockchain. About 10 years ago, a bunch of hackers were trying to figure out how to send cash over the internet, how to create a digital form of cash. Now, we could already do payments at, at that time. We had PayPal and you could pay via credit card. But cash is something different than payments. If I have a briefcase with a million dollars in cash in it and I give it to you, you have a million dollars. If I write a check for a million dollars and I give it to you, you don't have a million dollars. There's a third party in between the bank. They can think that that might be fraudulent. I could stop the check. All sorts of things uh, can happen. So a person by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto took all the theories that were out of time and wrote a paper about what he termed to be Bitcoin and the blockchain structure that underlied it. And fundamental to it was that it's peer-to-peer. -peer. It allows one person to transact directly with the other person without any intermediary in between. It was encrypted so that the value of Bitcoin that you have on that blockchain is yours. No one else can spend it because you're the only one who has the digital key to unlock the value and it has the same anonymity as cash. I'm gonna tell you how Bitcoin and blockchain actually work as I'm a software engineer. So here's the start of a lesson in cryptography. We're gonna start talking about digital fingerprints. This is the first line of the Gettysburg Address. I've just changed that line. Digital fingerprints help to know when the underlying content has changed. Here's the two versions side by side. The top version is unchanged, the bottom version has been changed. If I generate a digital fingerprint, it looks something like this. The second version of the digital fingerprint looks like that. They are completely different. If you have uh, the content that is perturbed in any way, modified, even the smallest amount, the fingerprint changes completely. What I did was I added a space before the last period. So I have a friend, his name is Parker. He's a musician um, and I can buy his CDs. If I give him $20, he will give me a CD of his. If one Bitcoin were worth $2,000 for easy math, I could record in this ledger that I gave him 0.01 Bitcoin, which is 20 bucks, and he called that a fair deal, I get a CD. We can then remove our names from it by having numbers and letters that 
signify us, but are different. And that provides anonymity because uh, transactions are all grouped together amongst people across the world. The transactions form blocks. Uh, 10 minutes worth of transactions across the wor world go into one block with one new block being created each, every 10 minutes or so. The block has a number, say one, two, three, four, five. It links back to the prior block, say one, two, three, four, four. You have the grouping of transactions. Here you can see the CD that I bought, a pepperoni pizza, and a car. <laughs> they are kept safe by having a digital fingerprint, what the technology that I, I had just shown you, so that no one can modify it without the fingerprint being altered. What the Bitcoin protocol did that was very unique and, and very beautiful was insert a challenge in there, that it isn't the, the raw fingerprint of the underlying data, but that the fingerprint must meet a certain standard. It must have a certain number of zeros in the beginning. Now, now that's hard, because it wouldn't naturally have that, that, um, those zeros in the front. And in order to make it have those zeros, someone has to guess a secret code that when added to the end of the transaction list, the end of the block of text, makes that fingerprint have a certain number of zeros. It's really hard to, to guess. Uh, it can only be done via guessing and checking. There is no algorithm to find it. It requires just lots and lots of guessing. Two to the 32nd power times 711 billion. Really, really large number. <laughs> there are millions of nodes, millions of computers that are doing billions and trillions of calculations and checks, guesses and checks per second trying to find this. It also makes it impossible for a hacker to change a value and, um, because they wouldn't have the computational power to regenerate the code needed to make all the rest of the math work. Now why are all these other nodes working so hard to calculate this code? Because there's a bounty associated with it. Just like the Federal Reserve can create new money, the Bitcoin protocol issues new Bitcoin from, from fiat for finding that secret code. Currently, the reward is 12 and a half Bitcoin. The protocol is beautiful in the way that it is self-regulating. The faster computational power gets, the easier it is to solve this problem, and so the problem gets harder, and the reward gets cut in half um, after a certain amount of time. The way that the problem gets harder is the number of zeros increase. I showed you in the last slide five zeros, it'll go to six, then it'll go to seven. It'll keep on having, it'll keep on getting harder until the, the limit is reached of 21 million Bitcoin. The price of Bitcoin has been rising dramatically. Uh, people ask me what the value of Bitcoin is, how it can be uh, assessed given that there is no, nothing backing it. One of the best explanations for that that I have found is by looking at the number of users of Bitcoin. There were 10 million users in November 2016, 18 million users November of 2017. The more users you have, the more interconnection you, you have and the more valuable a network gets. It's very similar to a, a social network and their interconnections and the value posed by that, there is a law called Metcalfe's Law that states that the value of a network is equal to the square of the number of its users. And that helps explain the exponential growth that you are currently seeing in the price of Bitcoin. Underlying Bitcoin is that global distributed secure database called blockchain. That has potentially more value because it applies to more things than just Bitcoin on top of it. It has spawned other forms of what are known as cryptocurrencies, Ethereum and Ripple being two of them. There are many more. All of them are peer-to-peer. -peer. Some of them have features such as smart contracts that say that criteria need to be met before dispersing funds. The blockchain can also host more than just uh, dollar values. It can really say that a person owns 
any kind of piece of, of data. And it can show the transfer of that from one person to the next. You can think of things like um, property lots and who owns a house and, and title companies and um, notarizing documents, shareholder certificates that have certificate numbers and those go from person to person. There are huge applications that this global database pose to the future and I invite you to think of all of the possibilities that can be created by having a system based on the laws of science, math, and algorithms. Thank you.